pause that real quick. Hello, hello. Uh, let's check sound real quick. I'm just doing some quick check uh, sound checks. Hello, I just got on to the... Hey, hello, Elizabeth. How are you? Hi, just to make sure that I look okay. My lipstick is all right. <laughs> Fabulous, darling. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, it's so good to meet you. I'm so excited. This, uh, this project, I have been waiting since I was 14 for a document. <laughs> Oh, no. So this was the thrill of my life. I'm so excited to meet with you. How are you? Great. great. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Uh, we're still just waiting on Mark, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, have you been through the, where are you? you're central, right? So where are you located? I'm in Chicago okay. and um, things are locked down here for the most part. And there were a lot of protests, but people were, were wearing masks. I went, I went to one or two and, you know, tried that. People were, were safe for what I, from, you know, except for the looting, everything was fine. Uh, same. I, I live in LA, so I had that same experience where we went out, we protested, and everyone was trying to, I thought everyone did their best to socially distance and maintain that, those guidelines, but you know that there were going to be a few people here and there show up who just showed up for the scene of it. They just wanted yeah. to see what's going on. So, but yeah, I, I get it. It's been, um, it's been a hectic uh, last few months, but uh, this- oh, History, right? We're living history and it's stressful when you're living through history happening. This moment right now and, and this project, this film, I think is more apropos now than ever it was. And it was always, it was always relevant. Um, but I think now, right now is the time to have this, a documentary and these these I'm so glad that you guys are going to have these um guest or fan panels because I know a lot of people and are going to want to interact with the with the dialogue and open dialogue about these these uh, yeah right yeah uh, there's tons to talk about yeah now if you look at if you take a look on your uh your zoom screen can you see the chat, the chat? Uh, yes I do. okay it's open I opened it so fantastic so I actually just put in the questions that I have for you ahead of time so we can keep things moving very quickly. Hello. Oh, okay. I don't see them on my chat. Oh, uh, let's see. Hello. Hello. Hi, Lisa. Hi. How are you today? Wonderful. How are you? Fantastic. I'm so excited for this. Um, I actually just, Elisa, if you want to help me maybe find a way to get these uh, questions over to, I, I just typed in the questions that I have for today into our chat. Okay. Kath, uh, but Elizabeth is telling me she's not able to see them. So I'm not sure. I don't see them either. Did it, this is going to sound like a silly question, but did it send? Sometimes if you don't hit enter, it doesn't send. It looks like it's, it's populated in the chat now. Let me go ahead and. If, if you'd like to email them to me too, I can. Pop them on the email right now. Cause I can share my screen. Um, and here I'll stick it right here. I'm going to save this for you. I'm going to share my screen so that we can show the trailer, if that's okay, uh, to start us off today. And then um, we'll get to those questions right afterward. And hopefully we'll have enough time to get all the, there's only five questions. But they could be very uh, deep and, you know, chunky. So let me go ahead and send those over real quick. Okay. So basically, the first question is, and we can we can do this now while I'm uh, spooling up our trailer for us, is uh, since we have Elizabeth here, we can go ahead and get started. Ask you that very first question. What were you doing before the pandemic and how did this pandemic impact your workflow on the Flannery Project? And okay, so you want me to go ahead and start before Mark joins us? Yeah, let's go ahead and get started since we're waiting on Mark uh, and we have very limited time today. Okay, great. And are you are you recording, Kat? And, and and start recording just one second. Okay, I think that's what we just want to clarify: is is this like the official start or just a preamble? Or <laughs> I, know, I just want to warm you up with a question, give it, give you a second to think, and then I'm going to go ahead and start right now. Make sure perfect. Make sure. And the questions disappeared. I see your Gmail account though. Ah, there it is. Okay, here are our questions. Where to go? Where to go? Oh, sent. Okay. Before I even hit record, I don't want to record all this nonsense. Okay, let's see. <laughs> okay, pause sharing. I'm going to stop sharing so I can go ahead and record.
Okay, we are recording officially. Uh, all of this will be cut out, of course, all the pre-stuff. Uh, no worries. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and start now. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to The Hollywood Times. My name is Kat King. I'm one of our many freelance and talented journalists uh, on staff at The Hollywood Times. And today we are joined by the indomitable, very talented Miss Elizabeth Kaufman. Uh, she is one of the uh, members of the, te- the creative team behind Flannery, an upcoming documentary about the life and work. Uh, and cause of Miss Mary Flannery O'Connor, Southern fiction writer. Everyone knows for A Good Man is Hard to Find. I think it's probably her most famous st- story, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But how are you, Elizabeth? I'm doing, doing fine. Thanks for asking. I hope you're doing well too, Kat. I'm hanging in there. You know, it's a, it's been a, a very stressful a, a time for us, but we're finding ways to make, uh, make the best of the situation. So, Yes, so before the pandemic and during the pandemic I've been uh, focused on finishing this film and getting it getting it out to the world so it's um, I also a college teacher so I was finishing up classes and had to suddenly take classes online I was teaching a comedy class and I had a lot of uh, improv comedy folks in my class and and they started doing some wonderful improv online so we've the transition to an online world has been fairly smooth for me i'm glad to hear that i know that it hasn't been smooth for a a lot of teachers i'm a teacher myself a former teacher myself so i understand the uh the flux that happened with many of my teacher friends on that one hi i'm mark mark has joined us mark is also one of the members of the creative team behind the flannery documentary welcome mark how are you thanks kat yeah i'm I'm doing fine you know making it all work in this uh, covid 19 storm but really happy to be with you all Fantastic. Well, we just got started, Mark, with the very first question already before you uh, jumped in. But you know what? I think you heard it already. We're, we're just catching up on what what uh, what impact the the work the uh, pandemic has had on the workflow of the Flannery project. Uh, well, yeah, Elizabeth has done the you know the um, the heavy lifting on that because all the editing is being done in her home <laughs> and all of that stuff. But. Um, no, it's, it, it, we had some of the um, opportunities, uh, as I'm sure Elizabeth said, to go to some film festivals. We were, you know, then told, you know, they were gonna be canceled or postponed. And so a lot of that's been part of our, of our experience. But, um, but in the same way, I'm kind of excited that, you know, uh, the, it's an entrepreneurial spirit with these uh, cinemas. And they're like, okay, well, let's do these virtual uh, theatricals. Let's get this out. And, um, so it's also kind of exciting that, you know, this is all coming together. I'm really, really impressed with how um, the whole, you know, community, the film community um, is really behind the, let's get these things up being shown, even at home. Uh, yeah. And- yeah. So we have, we have some wonderful premieres, uh, virtual premieres starting uh, in mid-July. So in, in a way, because so many people are looking for content, uh, we're, we're hopeful that this is really working out for uh for flannery that's right that's very true and and flannery opens in select theaters on what what day july 17th 17th and you can check the flannerifilm.com website for uh the list of locations and screening locations but there is one i believe the la screening is at lemley theaters is that correct yes lemley okay fantastic so um let's move right along to our second question how is it that you were able to uh get tommy lee jones and alice walker Virgin, all these wonderful uh, talented celebrities and iconic folks to uh, to join on the project. How did you find them? Should well, I start a little bit? Thank yeah, you. you start, Mark. It's a two part answer. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what, we knew that we had um, some good uh, in, interviews of, of friends and family uh, of Flannery O'Connor that were done in the late 1990s by a friend of ours, Christopher O'Hare, who's one of our executive producers. He gave me those films about 13, 14 hours of them. Uh, people like Sally Fitzgerald and others, um, uh, Bob Giroux, uh, Billy Sessions, just some excellent people. Well, anyway, we had that and we thought, uh, as I was doing research on Flannery, I just kept on noticing and, and of course reading anything on Flannery. I knew that Alice Walker had written on Flannery O'Connor. I knew that Hilton Ellis had written on Flannery O'Connor. I heard that, uh, I heard G- uh, Tommy Lee Jones say that, um, his aesthetic is kind of, um, basically kind of built out of Flannery O'Connor. James, uh, Tommy Lee Jones did his um, uh, his piece, uh, his excuse me, his his Harvard um, senior thesis on Flannery O'Connor. 
And so that's how I knew about that. And Michael Fitzgerald was also a friend of his. And so we really kind of noticed how many artists, uh, how many writers um, were really excited about uh, Fanny O'Connor and talked about her, her being a kind of muse in their own development as artists. So we went and we started these interviews uh, and Elizabeth came along. Uh, she just totally you know, got it and uh, is a, herself a Flannery fan. And we, together we kind of collaborated on these interviews with these wonderful people. They were all so generous with us too. It sounds, it sounds just like a wonderful opportunity to work with uh, tremendously talented and passionate people who really are committed to, uh, committed to her story, not just her work, but the story, the personal story of Flannery O'Connor, which uh, definitely moved me as a young writer and as a young uh, girl inspired by women uh, who, who were influential writers of their day. And I, you... I, had written Mar I had written Mary Steenburgen's agent a heartfelt yeah. letter about how she, we thought her voice would be perfect to be the, to be Flannery's, to be the narrator voice, because I'd seen her, I'm from Florida originally, and I'd seen her in the Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings film she had made years ago, where she played a writer, and, and it seemed to work. There's a timbre in Mary's voice, in Mary Steenburgen's voice, I think that this fits very nicely. When you listen to uh, Flannery O'Connor's reading, her own readings of her stories, uh, there is definitely a similarity. I love it. And I'm a big fan of Mary Steenburgen and all of the, all of the folks who are involved in the project. There but. is a big difference between the Arkansas and the Georgia accent. So just to <laughs> but, but make sure we like do understand that. And tell us that because she's from Jacksonville, Florida. From my ear, from my, you know, uh, Chicago ear, I don't hear that so much. But I hear the difference. Yeah. I think I, even though I, you know, I'm English, but my dad's from, my dad's from Chicago. So I grew up, um, so I'm, I'm about both American and uh, English, but the accent, I can, t I can distinguish it in hearing it, but um, how, so let me, let me ask you this. Tell me about the evolution of this. When did this really first begin to culminate or percolate in any, either of your mind and how did you get going on it? Cause uh, I tried when I was, 15 to inquire about how would one go about involving themselves in creating a documentary about her for, for a film project in school and had no luck. So how do you, how did you get it started? Um, well, Mark really started this project because he's a Flannery O'Connor scholar and he got connected doing research on her work and got connected to her trust. And Mark, you want to finish yeah, up? So, so, you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, a scholar of kind of a Catholic literary imagination. So even Waugh, Graham Greene, Flannery O'Connor, Walker Percy, um, you know, lots of these uh, writers that I've written on. Um, and um, so uh, my, I've always had a closeness to O'Connor because I was always fascinated with the kind of that aesthetics of violence and how can she be a Catholic modernist writer with all this kind of, how does the Catholic fit in there? So that was my early start. But really it goes back to a friendship that I've had with Christopher O'Hare who did these like these uh, interviews, he had been at Harvard when Sally Fitzgerald, who uh, was her her dear friend, uh, uh, um, she was she was still alive, and he was there, and he met her, and they started talking, and he became a Flannery O'Connor fan. Once you kind of get you know hooked, he was totally hooked. So anyway, he writes he uh, Sally Fitzgerald says, "Why don't you go and do these films? Uh, because people are dying who knew her. Uh, people are getting old. So anyway, these films were done in 1998 to 99." I'm with Christopher in I think 2005, six, and he hands them to me and says, listen, I, I thought I would maybe make a documentary. I don't think I'm going to do it. Why don't you take them on? Would you want to do something with them? And uh, so the per first percolation was right there. It's like, oh, we were given like, and really I think those interviews are still the backbone of much of our, of our, our documentary. Mm -hmm. So about 2011 or 12, I was doing a conference in Chicago and that's when Elizabeth, who's a great colleague of mine, I said, you know what, you're, you're a documentarian, you teach documentary film, you've won all these awards, can you see what you think? And when I found out that she loved Flannery O'Connor, it was like, you know, it was like a marriage made in heaven. So um, it really became, a, I think I would say 2013, we sat down and said, we have something here. Uh, we, we, we can really build a, a, a story about Flannery's life and about the importance of her work by looking at these these people who knew her in the biography, but also these artists who claim some affinity to her work or some sense of connection. So Elizabeth, you can you could probably round that out. Well, I took a look at these earlier interviews and I immediately thought, ah, this is an NEH project. And um, I, I'm not Catholic. I, was, I met Flannery O'Connor as an English major. So I was coming from the secular perspective 
and wanted to, uh, you know, raised Protestant in the South. And uh, so team in terms of coming to terms with you know a lot of the issues that Flannery was writing about that she faced in her personal life uh, and um, you know I just once I knew it was a great opportunity and yes we did get NEH funding and then uh, the Ken Burns Prize, which we were honored to get, but uh, absolutely. And, and if I may, Ken, I might say you, you, your question about how do you go about doing it is we had a relationship with the trust, and they never had allowed uh, things until really in the last well, until our film, really, they started opening up the archives. Um, and uh, we were really, um, really fortunate that they said, you can do this. And we were the first group to actually go into uh, a lot of the archival material about her early, her cartoons, her early life, her early journals, uh, some of the photographs, uh, the few that we you know, have. So it was really, it really helped having so many collaborators uh, who were open to this. Yeah, the first film to have complete story rights and, and life story rights. Fantastic. That is a, uh, thank you for so, so succinctly explaining the process. Cause for me, you know, I, I found Flannery O'Connor when I was in high school, my mother handed me a book, a, a collected, a collection and anthology of her short stories. And uh, we had an author project. My, my English teacher at the time said, Hey everybody, we're going to, we're going to get together. Everybody pick an author off this li list of names and it's American lit. So everyone is choosing uh, an, an American author and you're going to actually portray this author. So I had to pick somebody and I was an act. I was in, hugely into acting and theater in school, of course, but I picked Flannery O'Connor because I thought maybe I looked most like her. And then I, as I started to uh, read, the, st I, the first story I ever read was A Good Man is Hard to Find. And it it startled me because I wasn't expecting to read something. It, the story reads so... In, it, for, a, so for a girl growing up in California, you know what I mean? There's a Southern story. So these stories, they, they draw. She has the ability to suspensefully, sort of in a way, culturally, uh, tonally, move a story very, at such a slow pace that you might miss things. And when I was 15, I would miss some of these beautiful nuggets in, the, in that particular story. Now, ever since then, I've been obsessed with the, that one particular story. And I'm so curious as to the animation that we went, the animation of A Good Man is Hard to Find. Tell me a little bit, since we had a little bit of time, uh, about this animation, the animated version of A Good Man is Hard to Find. Can someone speak about that? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, we, we started with uh, our first problem is there was only one interview with Flannery O'Connor and not that many photographs. So when you're doing a documentary, a biographical doc, that's, you know, you have to solve that problem. A second issue was that the trust would, was forbidding us from uh, doing dramatic reenactments mm. to footage. So we had to get real creative about um, both illustration and storytelling and, and we smartly got the trust to approve a voiceover uh, for reenactment and motion graphics. Um, then because O'Connor started as a cartoonist, yeah. <laughs> uh, we hired three great female animators who just are so talented and they, they really dove into the project and her life story as well as her fiction uh, and took their own particular um, visual spins on um, both representing Flannery with crutches, it's Heidi Kumau and Kathleen Judge, who put a, a, an avatar of Flannery as a young girl and then a college student in the story. So uh, Natalie Barahona did um, A Good Man's Hard to Find. So we really um, were very fortunate and uh, they did some wonderful work. Yeah. Why, yeah, why do you, why do you think the trust, is it, I, I'm just going to guess that it's probably because they're just really trying to respect and preserve her memory. Mm -hmm. and uh, it's not just possible, but is there another reason you might be able to, to think of why they, why they wouldn't want a kind of dramatic reenactment or, uh, or even a film version of her life story, like a biopic? I think that the, the trust was just weary of uh, uh, people not understanding or not appreciating the complexity of, of, of who she was. Um, you know, uh, I've read over the years, so many people kind of misread Flannery, uh, in, you know, uh, in some ways, you know, and, and one of the things I think they were always worried about was that, uh, that, you know, the Southern manners of, you know, respecting who she was, 
her, her Catholicism especially, um, and that sense that um, they were protecting her. I think as, as the years went on, um, there was a kind of a movement uh, with with the with the trustees to say, you know, let's let's gi let's give this out to people who make a good case and who we trust, because we know their works already has already seen the the, um, the kind of complex texture of who Flannery O'Connor is. So I think it really has just been a kind of a, a gradual. Um, uh, a reassessment of how they're going to do it. I, I also would say that, you know, she's approaching, you know, um, it, those times when copyrights are ending and they're like, oh, maybe we should get people who we trust uh, to to f continue to kind of carry the baton for Flannery O'Connor. So um, right. a lot of that has happened as well. Um, I have a question. Go ahead, Noah. Okay, so I saw this news article that Flannery O'Connor was racist and that's why I joined. Is that true? I'm sorry. No, go ahead. That's a great question. Thank you, Noah. Uh, yeah, because I'm doing her for my like summer reading project right now. So yeah. And how old are you, Noah? Uh, I'm 14. 14. So about the same age I was when I, I read Vinery as well. It's a great <laughs> It's because we're doing like classic female uh, authors, you know, like the feminine mystique and stuff like that. So cool. Great. Well, it's right now, Noah, is a, it's a great time to be reading Flannery O'Connor and to be asking these kinds of questions because of uh, the George Floyd protest and, and everything that's happening that uh, Ken Burns, who is a supporter of the film, uh, described as the great reckoning for America. I mean, that my own attraction to Flannery was I grew up in the South with lots of racism and sexism and moved to New York City as fast as possible. And and it's taken me a long time to kind of come to terms with uh, some of what was happening there. And Mark and I both feel that in both O'Connor's fiction and her letters that, uh, that she does, she comes to terms with um, particularly white racism and the way it's, um, it expresses itself uh, she she uses really literal language like the N word that can be um, hard to read and uh, needs to be kept in context and understood in a historical framing uh, in terms of uh, personal racism as a kind of question. And in our film, we include some of the letters that are mentioned in, I think, the article you're pointing to. And we really leave it up to the reader to decide. We have many uh, writers and supporters who have uh, known some of O'Connor's history uh, growing up in the 50s and 60s and, and some of the things in her letters and, and her fiction, but also who understand that she, she interrogates and she she critically, creatively deconstructs the position of the white racist. So I think there's a lot to write about for a school project on O'Connor right now. Yeah, you know, if I can just add, I mean, Elizabeth really said it so well, but um, I think that Flannery O'Connor was aware that she was living in a time of change. Um, and so she, I like to call Flannery O'Connor probably uh, this kind of phrase, she's a recovering racist. She's always aware that, you know, from her own faith tradition and from what's going on, she knows that the arc of history, as we might say, to use Martin Luther King's notion, is changing, right? Uh, and so she almost uh, puts that into her stories. Um, but she also wants to listen to what racist conversation is like. And she wants to kind of, 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 of describe it almost like a journalist would do it or a documentarian. And so we see uh, that N word often in there, especially, uh, uh, and, it's, and it's a way to kind of almost kind of, everyone stands up or sits up and says, okay, she's, she's speaking about the racist culture that she imbibed as part of her own life and how she might make, turn it into a kind of an artistic uh, kind of maneuver. I'll tell you this now, when I teach Flannery O'Connor to, to college students, uh, I spend the first hour saying, okay, how are we gonna deal with this? Cause we're gonna read this out loud. How do you wanna deal with this word? And I let the students just kind of talk about it. And I kind of, we, we do a little bit of ex explanation, but they usually come to some terms and say, okay, we want to feel the tension. So we might not say the N word. We might just say black um, while they're saying it out loud, but they're seeing the N word on the page. They're saying black so that they also feel the complexities of racism that are kind of embedded in our world. So 
I think you're, I think uh, to the, uh, to the essay that you're speaking about, you know, lots of people have been looking at how do we contextualize the fact that she is really taking white racism or white privilege and kind of just saying, listen, this is ridiculous. You know, you are going to be upended. Your life's going to be turned upside down. It's not so much her black figures and characters. It's always these racist characters who get their comeuppets. Well, um, I do believe that she is like recovering from it because we read that she read To Kill a Mockingbird, which is about racism. Yeah, it's true, Noah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, That's great. Thank you for that question, Noah. And uh, thank mm -hmm. you. Mark and Elizabeth, thank you for uh, taking the time to respond. We do invite uh, um, our some of our readers and our members of our Hollywood Times group to to join us on some of our. This is all our Zoom uh, interviews are new for the Hollywood Times. It's a new territory for us. So thank you for being you know a uh, part of this opportunity to have, invite others to uh, just ask a few quick questions and uh, be a part of the experience with us today. We appreciate that. I know I didn't mention, um, I did not mention that would be happening. And I wanted to just say thank you for your, thank you for, really, you know, jump in and answer those questions off the cuff like that. It's very. Uh, oh, we love it. We love it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that being said, I, we, we have about eight minutes left and that's actually quite a bit of time. And since we have both Elizabeth and Mark with us, I just wanted to ask you what personal uh, meaning, what, why did you, uh, find this to be the kind of project you just had to be a part of and maybe that'll help Noah gain a little bit of insight as to your connection with this project and why continue to uh, put Flannery O'Connor's name into the American consciousness. Because we're both from the south because I'm currently in south Mississippi but uh, also because we're writing about uh, classical female writers like Jane Austen <laughs> and we're writing about feminism and fourth wave and third wave feminism. Interesting. That's why. Good stuff. Good stuff. Nice. I want to meet your teacher. I know. <laughs> Me too. That's fantastic. And do you feel like you're getting a good picture of things, Noah? Do you feel like you're getting some understanding? Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Maybe one, Maybe you might want to share one big takeaway that you, you, you have from what you've learned so far. Uh, from stuff like the feminine mystique or something like that. Well, that I feel like classical female authors were misunderstood mm. a lot. Mm. And I believe that you know, they should have done that more. Flannery O'Connor's full name is Mary Flannery O'Connor. And she dropped the Mary um, in graduate school because she knew that people would confuse her name and think she might be a man and help, that would help get her published and her fiction read, which, which was true. Yeah, because Flannery is actually named after her, one of her ancestors, uh, 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 who was a general. So, um, and so she, by calling herself Flannery O'Connor, she sometimes got letters that said, Dear Mr. O'Connor. Sometimes it was Dear Ms. O'Connor. And she loved, she wanted to do that because she was, she knew she was working in a man's world, that, that kind of New York uh, literate, literature, uh, literary kind of world. So, but you know, your question about, about why she's exciting too, is that uh, you, 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 ha you really take a deep dive with Flannery O'Connor. Um, someone once said you love her or hate her. I don't know who, a lot of people who hate her. I think there's some people who are cautious about her because of things we've been talking about. But um, so many artists find her like kin to them, right? I mean, they just, it's incredible to me. And so uh, for me, it's just been a, it's been a labor of love uh, really to kind of, to have what Elizabeth and I know about Flannery O'Connor and what we've done in this film to share it. And so people will return to the books, start reading again. Um, I have, I know Elizabeth can tell you how many emails she gets. People have seen the film at, at, when, at these little viewings and people are like, oh my God, I just picked up the, the complete stories. Oh my gosh, I'm writing, I'm reading it again. Oh my gosh, I haven't read this since I was 19, you know? So it is kind of cool to have uh, a community of, 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 of fans. Yeah. Well, she was diagnosed with lupus at a very young age and was having problems walking in her early 20s, was on crutches uh, for the remainder of her adult life after her mid-20s. And so her bravery, her stoicism, the fact that she just was not, um, she never felt sorry for herself and she really was driven to get her work done. So I was, as you know, editing and writing, I really wanted to try to get a sense of her point of view in the film. And that, that courage that I think her faith was a big part of that, um, to 
rise above uh, really the, the physical uh, challenges that, that she lived with, but, you know, soldiered on and did some great writing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but what a great answer. Thank you. Couldn't have said it better. What do you think, Noah? Uh, I think it applies very well. Yeah. Do you think she was a racist? Or do you think you need um, then? Not entirely, because, I mean, she died at 39, so I didn't think we got to see, like, her full change, so no. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Noah. She dies right as the civil rights laws were, you know, being enacted. Uh, so she's really at the beginning of some of that um, and didn't get to see some of it play out. Um, certainly, she didn't get to see 1968 play out, which would have been a pivotal year, so. Right. Good idea. She knew that the, the racial situation was a terrible thing. That was a word she used in one of her letters to describe yeah. it as terrible. Um, at the same time that she may have had some personal um, discomfort or growing and living in Georgia. So she, she really, um, from our perspective anyway, in the film, um, from what we knew, um, you know, we think it's something it's it's up to you to read her letters and read her fiction and come away with your own conclusion about it. Yeah, that's fair. Now we have uh, about three minutes left and we have a few other guests who've joined us on the Zoom call today. Miss Darlene and Miss Blue, would either of you like to ask a question or is it okay if, thumbs up if it's okay for me to wrap us up? Okay. All right. So um just one more time. Thank you so much for your time. I know you have very, you have lots of interviews lined up for today. I don't want to keep you any longer. <clears throat> Is there anything else you'd like to share with us about the project? Hey, Kat. Hey. I, I just wanted to tell you I've, I'm enjoying the Zoom and it's a very informative. And thank you so much for presenting this platform. Thank you to Valerie, our senior editor, for allowing us the <laughs> to do this we wouldn't be on here doing it without her blessing so thank you for the compliment and and anything else that anyone else would like to share before we go today about the project about anything you have coming up after this perhaps oh well, she was in theater and so was i oh that's great i love yeah. theater i'm i'm starting to work on a jacksonville florida documentary too uh, oh are you uh yes yes to, um, and i'll be uh going down for the republican national convention in August. That's, and that's, um, where are they holding it exactly? Do you, do you remember? Um, in terms of, the, well, I think things are still a little up in the air right now. And the mayor of Jacksonville, it's a very interesting story to watch the city and the governor uh, dealing with masks and, and safety issues. So uh, oh, that will, will be interesting. I'll keep an eye on all that. Definitely. That's definitely. How about you, Mark? Anything you'd like to share before we go? No, uh, just, uh, you know, just, uh, I'm more, I do some administration now. So how do I bring students back to campus and college uh, safely and um, that. And then so Flannery O'Connor has kind of been my, my rock to kind of go back to, re to the reality in my heart. So it's because sometimes all that stuff has been a little bit anxious, but I'm writing a couple of pieces uh, about Flannery right now for a Cambridge University Press uh, edition of, of, of writers. Um, and they're short, you know, 20 page pieces. And so that's what I hope to finish through the summer. Well, you be sure that, you know, send me a copy because I'd love to deep dive into that, all that good stuff with you. I love Flannery O'Connor and we'll mm -hmm. anything about her. I can get my hands on. Thank you so much again, everyone. You uh, take care, everybody. Take good care. Stay healthy. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much, Kat. Thanks so much. Lot, appreciate Kat. It. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.